as humans are part of nature. We're not separate from nature. We have a responsibility to make sure that nature is resilient, that it thrives, that it's healthy. We have a responsibility to care for it. And nature, in turn, enriches our lives in immeasurable ways. It's a very complementary and beneficial relationship. Open Lands is a regional land conservation organization based in Chicago, but uh, we work in the three-state metropolitan area. We believe that nature is vital to all people and should be close to where they live. At Open Lands, we look at that web of green in all its forms, from a vest pocket park, to a trail, to large landscapes like the one we're in, the Daewa National Tallgrass Prairie. And key to that is the relationship to people, because we know that long-term, that's how this land is sustained. Landscape preservation is a continuum, but at the center, really, is people's relationship to the land. I've never seen a public expression of the importance of nature in our lives in such powerful and diverse ways as we have during this period of COVID. We're poised on a fourth wave of conservation. And to me, that fourth wave of conservation, which isn't named, may someday be called the time of the great remembering. Because our culture has gone through a period of long forgetting, forgetting that we are connected to the land, forgetting that the land itself is what builds our culture and sustains it. And we are in the process in every aspect of our culture of remembering that we are connected to the land. And I think that wave is being born even as we're speaking. And the events of certainly the last four or five months have hastened that birth. And what it's allowed us to do is, is understand as a culture, regardless of where we live, we are beginning to really take into our own selves the idea that there is an outside on the other side of our front door. And that fourth wave of conservation will be different than any we've ever seen because it will stretch into every aspect of our life. It's a very exciting time to be in conservation. And it is being driven, I think, to a large degree by organizations like Open Lands that has a reach into many different aspects of conservation and has the ability to bring that to many, many different populations. Open Lands has been working with private landowners, the County Forest Preserve District, and a variety of organizations, including the Liberty Prairie Foundation, for as much as half a century here. And they've protected a lot of land in a variety of different ways. County plans are often overturned. Regional plans often don't have that much teeth. And so therefore, a regional organization like Open Lands can be very helpful in identifying important parcels and bringing together those decision makers who, in the end, will determine land use. It's wonderful, too, the way everyone works together on these properties. And you're able to protect these private land uses while at the same time having these natural areas, either public or private natural areas, that are legally protected, that are being restored. The key is not to ignore the privately held land, the key is to integrate the privately held land with the publicly held land. If you just have a piece of private property that's full of invasives surrounded by beautiful natural areas, you're not gonna keep the natural areas beautiful. So it really has to be integrated in a way that helps where both properties are helping each other. And in recent years, the pace of restoration has really increased. I think the first big restoration project here started back in the 1990s with the fen behind our house, Liberty Prairie. We have this beautiful trail, the Casey Trail, that connects the Des Plaines River Trail and gets us out into the western and northern parts of the county. You can go for many, many miles on these bike paths, and there's all sorts of spurs that you can get off on. We see horses, we see bikes, we see runners, we see hikers, we see just casual walkers. People really getting out into and enjoying nature in ways that they really would struggle with in a lot of parts of this area where development is just heavy and only broken up by the occasional strip mall or interstate. One of the other really special aspects of this area is that it's connected to so many things. We're right along the Des Plaines River the County Forest Preserve and other entities have protected that entire corridor. 
And so that's an area where natural species can move along freely. We're connected to that. All of a sudden we become part of that corridor. We're connected to Almond Marsh. You can walk to Almond Marsh from here. Rollins Savannah, just down the road. And so you have this spectacular network of natural areas in Lake County, which really are being linked up in ways that allow the migration, especially of mammals, but plants, insects, the birds that rely on the plants and insects, all of that can move together in these ways that makes the entire county richer and it's connected within itself. So that lets it connect to the larger areas outside. Really a special, special place. Trails, active recreation, that's part of our mission. We look holistically at the entire region and to see what that mosaic is that provides opportunities for everyone. Of course, we care deeply about nature itself. We're the stewards of it. But it's also land that needs to be experienced and enjoyed. The primary use for forest preserves is our trail system. Most people experience the forest preserves on our trails, whether they're walking or biking or hiking or bird watching, you know, whatever they choose to do. Deer Grove is a massive place. It's over 2,000 acres, so it's a really large site. You've got beautiful forested areas, but you've got these great vistas where you can see uh, native plants and, and wildlife and sandhill cranes. Uh, so it really is uh, like this unbelievable space, really not far from a big city like Chicago. So it's, it's, we're very lucky to have it. It's the first holding in the forest preserve systems back in uh, 1916, and it needed a lot of work. With the help of Open Lands, we've been able to do all of this restoration work. We were able to, to advocate and get dollars from the O'Hare Mitigation Program with monies that come to open space providers to restore their lands and make them healthy again. And what it looked like at the beginning and what it looks like now is, is night and day. And here at Deer Grove with restored areas, you have over 20 million gallons of additional stormwater that's being stored here in, in natural lands as opposed to going into people's basements or the sewer system. So there's real value in having these large open spaces in communities where people can use them, and there's real economic benefit to having them in these communities as well. I am very interested in planning for long-term pleasure in the community. I get great enjoyment in trying to plan and make the area better. And we're hoping to bring more value uh, to the area with the African American Heritage Water Trail, bringing more highlights, more resources to the area. We're next door to Lake Michigan, but uh, not very many people realize we're close to the Little Calumet River and the value that it could bring. So this trail will begin uh, to highlight some of the excellent assets that we already have. We were one of the first in the nation to focus in a large metropolitan area. At that time, uh, conservation was seen, you know, as a focus for rural areas, for wilderness, not big cities, suburbs, exurban fringe. Well, open land's existence in the community is double-fold. Uh, of course, they're teaching us more about conservation. And because we're dealing with nature and the outside, it's a definite plus uh, for our wellness initiatives. Uh, walking, biking, uh, canoeing, all those things that roll up into a better quality of life. 80% of Americans now live in metropolitan areas. 50% of the world live in metropolitan areas. If we aren't engaging these diverse populations in caring about land, in, in connecting to nature, in valuing it, how are we ever going to save wilderness and rural areas, let alone the important sites that are here, you know, within our metropolitan region. So it's absolutely critical that the conservation movement becomes richer and more diverse and has many more voices than it has had historically. That's a fisherman. See, he's going fast. He's going to a fishing spot. He doesn't see. <laughs> the birds or the turtles and all that stuff. And that's how I was, right? Just going up and down as fast as you could go. This is the Little Cayman River, but the Cayman River has two uh, portions. There's the upper and the lower. And one of the things that was amazing to me when I first started exploring the lower portion was how majestic it was, how uh, peaceful it was. You've got the Forest Reserve on one side, you've got property owned by the railroad on the other. 
and there's no houses, there's nothing. So again, you can open up your eyes, you would think you're out in the Upper Peninsula someplace or someplace just really remote, and you're not. You're right in the heart of an urban area, less than 10 minutes from home. So that's a surprising thing. I didn't know that you could get something this tranquil so close to home. That was an amazing thing for me. And it's a great river. It's got a lot of character to it. And you will see animals that you don't normally see. Eagles, turtles, you'll see deer come up and get water. You know, you'll see these things as you're in a canoe or a kayak compared to a big power boat when you're just driving by fast. The river cleanups that we've organized have been very helpful in being able to educate and raise awareness to people that live in the area, particularly the little kids, the eight, nine, ten-year-olds, that didn't know that this river was here, A, and B, that didn't know it was a river. And so by participating in the river cleanup, we had an opportunity to transform their minds and educate them that, hey, this is a live river in your area. This can be used for recreation and enjoyment. And oh, by the way, you shouldn't throw garbage in it. And it's evolved from just a river cleanup, as it was the first couple of years, to now also include introduction to canoeing and kayaking as well. Leave the phone in the car. Best advice. Open lands is important to water trails, to bicycle trails, and to a lot of the community outreach. Open lands will coordinate the, the corporate sponsors, the governmental agencies, and bringing people together for the purpose of educating and preserving our natural area that we have here in Chicago. Open Lands was very instrumental also in helping us advocate for additional entry to the river, putting a ramp in at Kickapoo Woods. And the community uses the area a lot, but they didn't know that the river was there. And now they have access to the river. And that's a great thing. And I don't think that would have been possible without Open Lands. Community engagement is key for everything. We need to take care of where we live through conservation, through stewardship, through volunteerism. I strongly believe that's how you grow a community, starting with the kids, the teens, and the young adults. I work primarily on the Space to Grow program, which is Chicago's Green Schoolyards program. We are transforming asphalt play lots into green schoolyards where children can play safely, communities can gather, and children can learn outside. With climate change, we're going to be experiencing more intense storms, which means more rainwater will be falling. Space to Grow schoolyards are helping communities to be more resilient to climate change. We're installing green infrastructure, such as permeable surfaces like permeable asphalt or permeable pavers, soccer or football fields that have artificial turf that water can infiltrate through, but also trees and native plants that absorb a lot of water. Each space to grow schoolyard can hold at least 150,000 gallons of storm water underneath the schoolyard, which with all 20 space to grow schoolyards put together is over 3 million gallons of water per rain event. Open Lands is interested in all of our public lands. We care about a vest pocket park. We care about a ball field. We care about the trees in front of an apartment building. Tree Keepers Program is a volunteer leadership program of Open Lands. We are trained by staff at Open Lands and professionals throughout the Chicago region to lead groups of volunteers in tree planting and tree pruning all across Cook County. Tree canopies are critically important because they are essentially nature-based solutions to climate change. We hear a lot about technological solutions to climate change and policy solutions, but probably the easiest thing we have right in hand right now are trees. We have a lot of trees right here in the city of Chicago and they do a great job of shielding us from the effects of climate change right now. So we get a lot of storm water um, when we have heavy rain events. Trees suck up all of that water. They take it out of the streets, out of the sewers, and out of our basements. They shield us from the incredible heat that we get in the summer. Particularly the canopy of trees really protects us from the heat island effect and reduces heat costs all throughout the city. One of the big benefits of the Tree Keepers program and one of the things that Open Lands really focuses on in our work is the restoration of the urban canopy. 
Um, and that means not only planting new trees every single year, twice a year, but also maintaining the canopy that we have. It's really critically important that that urban canopy remains in as healthy a state as possible, not just for the ecological benefits that it provides to our ecosystems here in Chicago, but also to the, the health benefits and the happiness benefits, frankly, that that urban canopy provides to urban dwellers and residents. It's some of the only green space that a lot of people in the city of Chicago will ever experience. And so we want to make sure that it's in the best condition it can be. One of the things that's unique about open lands is the way we think about land preservation. I think when people hear the phrase land preservation, they think of national parks, they think of big landscapes, often the most dramatic. And while we do work on landscapes like that, Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie or Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge, we also work on small parks right in urban cores, just like Ronan Park right here. It ranges from big dramatic landscapes to the smallest piece of urban greenery that any resident will interact with. We have a responsibility to restore the land as much as it is protected. Development has not been kind, <laughs> and our landscape is very fragmented. So part of what we're doing is weaving that together, this tapestry again of blue and green. The Boone County Conservation District and Open Lands has been working together to protect important conservation lands along the stream corridor and within the watershed over a decade now. And that relationship has cultivated in the preservation of at least six or seven hundred acres of important conservation lands over that period of time. There's a lot of topography here, so there's some rolling hills. Then there's these uh, great oaks that are standing behind me, and that's oak savanna. And then in front of it, we have some restored habitat, which was cropland, and we converted it back to its native plant materials, kind of a short grass prairie. That habitat blends into the next, and it buffers the habitat that's over there, which is all contributing to the unique part of this site, which is the Piscasaw Fen. We are trying to implement on the landscape scale, the important things that help address issues like habitat fragmentation and flood control and water quality issues that are associated with streams, surface water, and groundwater. Because like the site behind me that has these wonderful native plants, this vegetation has root systems that allow water to just soak right into the ground and you don't get any surface water runoff. Instead, you get groundwater recharge, which will eventually replenish our surface water streams through the natural hydrologic water cycle. So we're uh, really gaining some important functions and benefits to the health and welfare of our community and benefits to wildlife and the natural environment. Medewin's landscape is very rich. There are two prairie groves here that survive. There are wetlands, and there's prairie, there's savanna, not too much, but a bit. <laughs> and while it's primarily prairie, it's not exclusively. And so this is the largest habitat for grassland birds in this part of the upper Midwest. And that was sort of the signature in a way. But again, it's much more diverse than just prairie. And I think that's part of its attraction and the value that it brings, that people can come here and experience a variety of important plants and animals and nature that you can't see elsewhere in the metropolitan region, including bison that have been brought back for the first time in about 200 years. We work with partners to identify opportunities to protect that land. Sometimes it's acquiring it or getting conservation easements on it, then restoring it often. But we also have to continually be vigilant and make sure that we're protecting it in perpetuity. We call the Midwest the heartland, and we call it that, I think, geographically because it's in the center of the country. But emotionally, it is the heartland of the country in many ways. It's a place that speaks to us as a people. Hackmatack was really born out of a desire to share a piece of that heart with the rest of the country. We have things that have survived here that are incredibly unique. This is not the Tetons. It doesn't scream at the top of its voice uh, that I am a glacier. It's not the redwoods that you walk through and you feel like you've walked into a cathedral. 
it's not the Smoky Mountains where you have more tree species in 50 square miles than you have in countries in Europe. But what it is, is it's a slow magic. It's a magic that takes a lifetime to understand and it unfolds slowly. It unfolds just like Midwestern corn, fields of ripening corn. And it unfolds slowly like an August day that just winds from dawn all the way into that long, sleepy summer evening. It's a slow magic that takes a lifetime to realize. And it's worth sharing with the rest of the country. It began with a small group of individuals from the Hackmatack area and one of the things that we learned early on in that process was that it was going to take a big grassroots efforts to bring a national wildlife refuge to a place where you typically wouldn't think there would be a national wildlife refuge. And almost from the first month, Open Lands was there. It was the organization that was willing to take on the project. It was the organization that was willing to lend its political know-how. It was the organization that was willing to lend its connections into the community. And so from the very start, Open Lands became that umbrella that other organizations could come under. One of the strengths that Open Lands brings is its depth of experience. It's the oldest NGO in the region. It's been through bringing large projects into being like the Indiana National Lakeshore, like the Medewa National Grassland, like Hackmatack. But it also operates on a micro scale within the neighborhood, so it's just as good at bringing a tree on the block or taking a vacant landscape and turning it into a community garden. And it's that marriage of that large know-how and that small, intimate touch that affects people's lives where they live. The longer we work with these landscapes, the more we work with them on a personal level through volunteers or through school groups, where we put our sweat equity into restoring that landscape, the deeper our connection becomes with them. And it's a connection we all have inside. It's a connection our soul has never forgotten. And it's a connection that the landscape reawakens. There is a very old language out there, and it rises from the bones of the earth itself. And that language is a language that we have within our very soul. And when we hear it, sometimes as a whisper, when land first begins to recover, it grows louder and louder and louder as we work on that land. In ecological restoration, small areas are important, but so are large. Small areas, especially if they're in good condition, are like a set of blueprints. Imagine the landscape before it's been modified by human settlement and in it is all the biodiversity that has come down over tens of thousands of years and those small pieces that today after all that change to the landscape still hold that integrity, the one acre prairie, the two acre woods, those are the pieces of the blueprints that are left. If we save enough of them we can take those pieces like a jigsaw puzzle and we can reassemble the entire blueprint for how the landscape functioned. Large areas are important because in northeastern Illinois, we only have postage stamps left of those blueprints, a drift in a landscape of developed land. If we're going to take what's unique about this area and we're going to pass it on, then we need to have both those blueprints and we have to have the space to apply those blueprints to the landscape. So large areas like Glacial Park, which is 3,000 acres, areas like Hackmatack that could someday build out in 50 years at 8 or 10 or 11,000 acres are the places where we can take the full gamut of how the landscape once functioned and we can place them back into the context in which they once occurred. That can't happen on a one acre site. That's important because it provides us that blueprint, but it's on these large landscapes, these blank canvases, where we begin the restoration process where we paint the future. We need to build a much broader base of advocacy and we need to share tools with diverse voices who care, who are suffering most, quite frankly, from the impacts of climate and other challenges, especially in underserved communities. They have the most at stake and they often feel they don't have any way to express their concerns or to have any impact. So we as Open Lands try to give them some of those tools or coaches in a way, but they're the ones who are doing it. And so I think long term, that is the future of our planet, and it's the future of conservation in a narrower sense within our region. You know, this tapestry of green and blue at all these different scales, it connects us to the Amazon, it connects us to the globe. And we are all citizens of the world, 
and the challenges we face are global, but they play out here at the local level. The lessons learned and the challenges we face are so common, and we need to learn from each other about how best to address them. If we lose the land itself and the things that lose in it, we lose a piece of our soul. We use the poetry that makes being a human being worthwhile. And so for me, this has never really been about the biological diversity. I think those are the pluses you get along the way. It's about saving sunsets, it's about seeing rainbows, it's about listening to water speak as it goes over rocks. It's about getting up in the morning and having the, the stillness drowned out by the song of birds. It's the first time you see a butterfly nectar on a plant that wasn't there 10 years ago and that you knew you restored. It's about our connection to the land and it always will be. And it's about our connection to ourselves, And it's about our connection to that greater universe that we're part of.